Hello, Cynthia. So Hello. great to see you. You are just in time here. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the joy to meet you yesterday when we had our test, so everything worked fine. And I, I've seen what you, what you are into, your topic, and I'm really keen on um, getting to understand what you are doing. Um, so the stage is yours, and here you go. Hello, thanks for the intro. My name is Cynthia Lim, and as we have been speaking nerdy, I'm first going to take my non-nerdy part. Um, and talk a bit about me as a musician. So I was trained as a classical pianist at the Royal Conservatory of The Hague, specialized in chamber music, became part of the magma duo, a violin and piano duo together with Emmy Storms on violin. And actually we were the first winners of the International Feast of Duos competition, which was co-initiated by Alexa E. Goodesman, who happens to be in a parallel room right now. Um, I do hope, even though Alexa is really cool, that you'll stay here listening to me. Um, so one thing we as musicians have really been looking at is to champion the unknown. And to give one illustration of that, I'm going to speak to you about a work by Matthijs Vermeulen, a Dutch composer. He wrote a violin sonata in the 1920s, um, but it was a rather complicated piece. And it was also a rather complicated person. And as a consequence, this work basically got silenced. Uh, it was only first performed in 1963. Imagine, it was finished in 25, that's many years. It's been recorded once then by Jarin Walta, who was the violin teacher of Emmys at the conservatoire. And then years after, when Emmy was going to graduate, we were both still in school, Jarin came to us and said like, hey, maybe this is a piece for you. And we started practicing it. And it was indeed a very hard piece, but it also was a very nice piece, we figured. And we really fell in love with it. We played it at Emmy's exam, and then we were graduated young musicians having to get on stages. So we tried, when, when concert halls tried to hire us, we tried to get this piece on stages. And that was a problem, because this was complicated contemporary music. So people told us, don't do that, too difficult. No one is going to listen to that or come for that. Please play Brahms or Beethoven. And we really loved Brahms and Beethoven, but we also still really loved Vermeulen. So we as musicians started to think, what can we do about that? And then we figured that in the Netherlands, there was this talent development program called Dutch Classical Talent, which was something organized by all the national concert halls, as well as our Dutch uh, broadcasting classical music station, Radio 4. And what would happen there would be that you as recently graduated musicians would audition. And if you would be selected, you got a season to prepare a concert tour in the next season where you would have carte blanche for what was coming on stage. So we decided to audition. We first played Stravinsky. Uh, we first played Janacek. Those are contemporary composers too, but they're a bit more uh, yeah, acceptable in a certain sense. We got to the second round. We played five minutes of Matthijs Vermeulen and 18 minutes of Francis Poulenc. Again, a composer people tend to like. And we got selected. So then we said, okay, great. Now we get uh, concerts uh, all across the country. It was more than 10 concert halls we are going to play the Sonata of Matthijs Vermeulen. And our coaches looked at us and said like, well, that's a bad idea, not going to get audience. Are you sure about this? But we were sure and they had to grant that to us, right? At least the good thing was while we were coached and as musicians, we also were really encouraged to think about ways to present ourselves. And clearly influenced by Alexa E. Goodisman and Yankee Ju, we started to experiment also with other forms of presentation. And you see an example of that in the middle, we also played some more, more popular types of works, uh, Zigeuner Bison, for example, we reworked it in a more theatrical form and we co-programmed that with these hard contemporary pieces and people actually really loved it. So this was a way to, to make a concert as a whole more attractive, more accessible. And as people got more exposed to this particular piece, they actually got more into that up to the point that we were honored to make the second recording of this piece, which actually was internationally noticed. So that's really cool, but that took me five years. And that was one piece. Now, my nerdy part is a computer scientist. And computer scientists don't like working on a project for five years and then have one outcome. So this has really been something that inspired me as well as a computer scientist. I got very interested in these large information collections in search recommendation and discovery. Uh, had the luck that my PhD was funded by Google and I was a four-time intern out there uh, working uh, on Google Play Music as well. Ultimately, I did return back to uh, TU Delft, Delft University of Technology, such that I could teach and also perform research that was a bit more, let's say, in the public space. And regarding that, uh, if you would ask to me what I'm doing these days, I'd frame it like this. Uh, I like to work on research in which we figure out how to digitally represent that what is hard to measure and how to keep it within reach of human users. 
So this discovery of new contents, exploration of something new, that's something really driving me. Uh, and I'm always inspired then by pretty secondhand bookstores that we see less and less where I could walk in. It's very chaotic. I, I know they might have something for me or not. I just stumble upon something and then I figure out that I actually found a hidden treasure. Now that's really something we don't yet have in digital information space. We do have an enormous choice. Theoretically, for anyone in the world, it's much easier to get to all these obscure things like the Sonata of Matthijs Vermeulen, but they have to find a way to get there. And our common filtering mechanisms don't really facilitate that up front. So this is something that was really interesting to me. Um, frankly, a viewpoint I think AI needs more generally. So I'm doing that now in, in broader multimedia domains, but clearly a domain that's really close to my heart still is music. So regarding that, one of my first collaborative research projects as a computer scientist and a musician at once was this project called Phoenix, uh, held within the EU, which was about ways to make digital classical music more accessible. And it came out of an observation by musicians and music institutes, where we figured that concert halls are closed spaces and we have a certain type of audience that finds these concert halls, but ideally we'd, we'd like to reach a broader and more diverse audience. Now, the thing is, beyond the people who really like classical music, there are some others who might like it, but just have no clue. They may enjoy it. They may have had exposure to it in other forms, like film music. If you would put it in front of them, they'll like it, but they need an entrance. And something I really started realizing when we were doing user studies regarding this topic was that we as insiders inadvertently put up barriers towards them. We like to geek out about different ways to interpret the same phrase. Uh, we like to speak about how sophisticated this particular theme relates to that particular other theme. And that's great. I really enjoyed it myself too. However, if someone else comes in who is not exposed to that yet, who um, yeah, just wants to enjoy this, gets emotional if they listen to classical music, cannot really say anything beyond that it makes them cry. We sometimes are rather derogatory towards those types of people. And I think that's not justified. And I think we really should be able to get them in without necessarily hampering the experience of the more sophisticated audience that's already there. So here we thought digital technology could give a really nice way to give personalized and customized guidance. Think of digital program booklets for the future. So that's what we worked on in this project. We worked on technology to make this concert experience more accessible to different types of audiences. We improved score following, automated score following technology. We worked on visualizations, interviewed people to see what kind of information they'd like to, to see to support their enjoyment of what they were experiencing on that stage. And simple things like showing which instrument is performing, that's something that for us is super obvious, but for someone who sees an orchestra for the first time is really complicated and very interesting to see happening. So we worked on all that, supported by audio, video uh, analysis technologies. We came with some user prototypes. There even was a, a commercial, uh, inspiration from that. So there was this tablet application facilitated by the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra, a second screen app where you had your tablet, you could watch performances recorded by the orchestra, but also have side information you could have on your tablet. At first it looked like what it was on the left. So you could see a performance and then follow the score, but that was this classically cut out manual support that someone hand timed in that. And thanks to the advances in our projects, it turned to the thing on the right, where you see, a recording and a much more flexible digital score with flexible score following. So those types of uh, applications happened. I mean, that's really nice. And then the project was gone and then it was silent. And why was that? Because everyone was very enthusiastic about this, but there didn't seem a clear way to go forward in a practical, economically viable way. And basically that was because I think we made a bit of a mistake. We worked on a classical value chain that was specialized and expensive. The biggest commercial application coming out of this vision right now was the tablet application, which is a rather exclusive application. Um, it needs a lot of manual, high expert curation and annotation. You really need very high definition, very good resources, high quality commentary. So it puts a lot of demand on experts. And if you do a lot of work, it really needs for all these algorithms to be completely perfect. And then you get into this end application. But that's a long and expensive road. So when we thought about ways to go forward on this and try for this idea more, maybe it's good then to think like a computer scientist. And that means that there are two phenomena that we care about, abstraction and skill. So regarding this abstraction phenomenon, classical music, it's not just something in concert halls, it's not just something on the web. 
It's actively practiced and studied and enjoyed by many different audiences, by scholars, orchestras, choirs, instrument players, people who just like music, even though they cannot explicitly express that. And as they are looking at maybe different repertoires, I mean, a choir singer will not perform the same thing as an orchestra player, probably, unless it's a choral type of symphony. They might also use different vocabularies. A scholar might have a much more sophisticated uh, vocabulary than someone who just likes music. They still are interacting with digital resources which have shared characteristics, which have shared demands regarding the data representation, shared modalities. Everyone needs scores, everyone needs audio, everyone might need for audio to be transcribed properly. And regarding that thinking of skill, I've now deliberately been using um, the vocabulary of Mozart since we are now in the uh, virtually in Salzburg. Um, experts, Kenner, they are scarce. But amateurs, or rather, I really more like the word Liebhaber, which is less derogatory, they are numerous and they're passionate about music. We, we might not be able to get them into curate a scholarly digital edition, but we still can maybe engage them in a citizen science way to help other parts of this pipeline such that we can create such an edition. And maybe then different types of audiences can contribute towards mass digitization efforts. So that was the idea between this new project that we call TROMPA, again, a European research project, and it stands for Towards Richer Online Music Public Domain Archives. And we're thinking of a value chain that looks more like what I'm showing right here, where there are many different resources, there are many different applications relevant to different types of audiences, and there is a kind of shared information layer underneath that many will benefit from. Again, everyone will need scores, everyone will need audio. So maybe we can jointly collaborate across all these applications and across, across all these resources to grow that knowledge. And that knowledge can be grown partially with the power of algorithmic approaches, but partially it also really needs this human in the loop um, phenomenon because some things are just easier for humans to fix than for algorithms, whereas other things are easier for algorithms than for humans. So to give you a more concrete example of that, we look at that in this project across different modalities, also regarding audio, uh, also um, regarding interlinking with multimodal resources. But I'm going to focus now on scores and on the digitization of scores, because this is something almost everyone needs when they think of musical applications in the future. Now, if you are an orchestra and you want to play a symphony, you might have to go through a rental party to get your parts. And those rental costs are very high. Now, for public domain works, that's not really necessary per se. If you have another form of that work, that could work as well. Now, we have the IMSLP. It's a wonderful resource. I use it a lot. Many musician friends of mine use it a lot. It has many scanned scores, but typically they're PDFs. And we might want something more than that, a more digital, flexible format. And a great example of that has been this open score project powered by MuseScore, uh, which is focusing on liberating, liberating exactly this public domain sheet music where people choose a public domain work, they transcribe that in MuseScore, and then you have your digital score that you can export in different formats, such as PDF, but also music XML or MIDI, such that it indeed can be repurposed in many different forms. We really like that concept and we really believe in that idea, but we wanted to take that idea a step further and think, as I said, more from a collaborative perspective. If I show you this, this is quite complex information to transcribe. So let's say coming from this idea, this is the Mahler Fourth Symphony, the first page of it. Um, if you are choosing to transcribe Mahler IV as a whole, you probably will spend a lot of time transcribing that on your own. But if you would have to transcribe this, that's a bit easier. This is even easier than the previous example. And say that you cannot read scores. I might still ask you if I show you pairs of these bars, if they have the same content. Anyone who can identify notes can say that the upper part, indeed those two bars have the same content and the lowers don't. So this is something where probably we, if we can split up the score into smaller units, we can maybe do more in a collaborative and scalable way. Also, that particular fragment, that's so common, it will not be content only occurring in Mahler 4, but in many other works, be them obscure or popular. So if we recognize this across maybe different works, we might propagate our understanding of what's in there. So that's the idea behind this collaborative score creation. Can we maybe split up more complex parts into smaller parts? Can different people start working on this? Can people with different expertise levels contribute to different aspects of that? And in terms of humans and algorithms, how can they optimally collaborate? An algorithm will be really good at chopping out all these different bars and maybe making some schedule on this is hard, this is similar. If you do the hard thing first and you transform that to the similar parts, you might not have to 
translate every single rest out there, for example. Um, at the same time, in terms of this human aspect, maybe in the case like this, that's Mahler 4, the Mengelberg score that he used with the Concertgebouw, here you might want humans rather than algorithms. If you want to transcribe all these notes that Mengelberg made, they are especially of interest to I think conductors and scholars. These people will willingly go into that and transcribe all that. I could theoretically train a vision algorithm to do the same, but I think that's not as useful. And also there, I think that humans would be very, very willing to dig into this and help us transcribing what's in there. So with that, we are thinking of having different parties contributing to this digitization effort and then having these shared components that everyone can reuse. We have chosen to use MEI, the Music Encoding Initiative, rather than Music XML. Music XML is an interchange format that came out of the publishing world. MEI was more made by scholars for scholarly use. So it's semantically a bit more musically motivated uh, and it allows for, let's say, more complicated scholarly usages, which are one of the usages we're thinking of. And the nice thing to hear was that actually the Neue Mozart Ausgabe is also indeed using that format earlier today. Uh, we used it together with a new framework called MELT. I'm not going to go very deeply into that, but basically this allows for us to treat these encodings as linked data in connection to other linked data. So a score becomes a linkable object on the web, which can connect to other objects like Wikipedia articles, uh, performances, audio, MIDI, other scores. Now, S scores are XML files, they are pieces of software. And I deliberately took this screenshot from Tobias de Boeg earlier today. He showed a wonderful example of how this works in the Mozart Ausgabe. Uh, so it's code. It's code that represents a score. It means we can version it, it means we can branch it, collaboratively work on it and merge it. So it naturally would allow for this more collaborative take we are thinking of. And generally, from a computational musicologist perspective, you can digitally batch process and analyze it, which again is kind of cool. So if we combine that, we can think of a future in which there are public domain works for which many parallel score versions exist that might all be kind of jointly created. And that these parallel versions exist, that's legit. I mean, you might want to have a particular scholarly edition, you might want to have an urtext, but you might also want to have a musicologist coming in and criticizing the urtext on a small part with something else. And this format allows for that in terms of representation. As a player, you might have some private markings you might want to digitally store, but not share with others. We're also piloting on that, what we can do about that. It's that we can link and annotate even with multimedia or other web objects. And we can think of applications, applications such as the thing you see on the right, a rehearsal companion we're envisioning. Say you're a pianist and you're practicing a piece. We can record on what you're rehearsing. We can give you some feedback on what you play together with the digital score. Um, and this is something really we are creating right now with our partners at MDV, this is the Conservatory of Vienna, and also with piano students out there. And many more applications would be possible as long as we have these core components and the audio and the video and all these other components we can think around that. So what I wanted to use this presentation for is not just to share that vision with you, but also really ask if you could probably help us out here. For the ones who are a bit more nerdy and like to read both code and music, MEI is a relatively new standard. It has not been, as it came out of the academic world, it doesn't really have a lot of products associated to it yet. So it's really beneficial if more people start to learn it. It's Again, it's just an XML type of dialect. And that can help us with these transcription experiments. And we won't be asking you to transcribe a whole Mahler symphony, but we might be asking you to come up with some small transcription tasks and see how easy it is to learn that language and get it out to other people. If your reader like music, you can help piloting these tasks, we can give you some of these simpler tasks that are not requiring technical knowledge, just verifying if the transcription is correct, maybe listening if the audio is correctly synced to what we show in terms of the symbols. Um, as said, we are targeting many different audiences at the same time, musicologists, orchestra players, choir singers, pianists, and people who generally like music. For all of them, we envision different types of applications and components to be useful. Yet still, again, there is an underlying general layer that everyone sources from. Now, in terms of testing, whether those applications ultimately indeed are things that these audiences like, and if these components meet the specifications, also there, we are very soon, within a few weeks already, probably ready to go beta testing on that. And also for that, you might be our target audience or know the target audience. And finally, for the business people among us, I'm an academic and a musician, so I can do research and I can describe music. I do have uh, colleagues in our consortium that are technical business people, but also maybe a bit more on the technical side of that story. So none of us have a user base with a big 
music surface where we can very easily integrate these components. But we do think that that is the future, that we can think of CAPTCHAs maybe even, CAPTCHAs on IMSLP of anything like that, where you can very shortly just fix a particular transcription if it's fine or not, or check if a certain note in one score is the same note in the other score, things like that. So if you have services or products with relevant audiences for which you think we can integrate this vision, then please do reach out because we would love to get in touch with you. So on the right, I put a QR code um, as well as a redirection link that will get you to a form. And through that form, you can indicate your interest to, uh, to collaborate with us or to join our future user study. So I do hope that many of you will have interest in that. And that's basically all I wanted to say. So um, I would very much look forward to answering any questions you may have. I saw things popping up, so maybe there are some questions. So thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I have one question. What, mm -hmm. what is, uh, in, in, in your experience, what is the biggest challenge in digitizing scores? I mean, there are so many, right? I think the, to me, it seems the biggest challenge is finding the optimal balance between what generalizes and what is specific. Mm -hmm. So we, if we look at what is there in terms of optical music recognition, it often came out of rather specialized domain requirements. So people doing Renaissance music, people doing certain classical repertoires, they wanted to do that. They were typically musicologists, which means that the information models behind it are very rich, but you risk getting into a discussion where you wonder whether a dot is a dot or just a piece of dust. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the problem. Uh, but at the same time, on the other end, you have this, this more abstracted view on it, where you can maybe globally look at everything and just see what is corresponding between different sources and across different domains. That is something you typically don't see in the musicologist uh, domains, where computer scientists might have more of the thinking, but of course they can overgeneralize and maybe then throw away semantically meaningful information. Mm -hmm. So finding an optimal balance in there and getting the right audiences that see that same vision, uh, that seemed to me so far a bit of the, the, the largest challenge because we have a lot of debate, like, but if it's not a piano score, can we still ask a pianist? And, but then if it's like a very specific scholarly use, which is it indeed true that one specialized musicologist is the only one being able to say that? So, so this is what we, what we are, are wondering about and what we're trying to see. How we yeah, can ultimately strike that balance. Yeah. And um, so I, I, can, I, can, I can imagine that you need as much as help as you as you can have from yeah. people out there right so you need um uh, people that are working in that area that would like to um help you to identify um that would help you to test your tools um beta test do some beta tests so um if you think you you are um and somehow connected in a way like uh, to help cynthia on that project uh, get in touch with her on on slack and um, um, you can, I guess you will, you will uh, help uh, the audience on Slack and show your link again yes, so that, that everybody knows that, how yeah. to sign up for you. Mm -hmm. So um, let me ask the attendees, is there any question? So uh, let me show, let me see. I have a question from, okay. So I think Alexi actually was the first one in terms of which pieces uh, already are offered to, with, with MEI. Wow. Um, yeah. Now, the thing is there that that's actually we don't yet, we're trying to work on actually a Mahler symphony with a student orchestra. Um, in terms of pieces we have offered with this concept, we're not yet there because so far we've been working on the, on the scheduling concept and the design of the tasks. We do have, however, um, a colleague of ours at MDW did encode a lot of the Beethoven works. Uh, so Bagatelle's the work of Clara Schumann, which is the one you see on the MDW demo. So we have some, some PNS data. There, is, there are some other resources. The Neue Mozart Ausgabe as said, has done this. And we are now trying to get it towards the more seemingly complicated scores, which however, if you properly um, break them up into smaller pieces might actually be simpler. So as said, we're interested in orchestras and, and orchestra scores, they look super complicated, but internally per bar, maybe the content is much less than in a piano score. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's, there's a lot of questions popping up here, I can yeah. see. Which type of music does the yeah. system work with? Only so, classical music? We would not be restricted to that. So at the moment in our project, we did commit to online public domain music. And we have been deliberately steering a bit towards the classical repertoire because we have more expertise in that, which still is rather broad. So we do have also musicologist colleagues who are specialists in 
Renaissance lute music, which has uh, a different type of notation than classical notation. So we're looking at all those types of pieces, uh, also because if we have to score them in terms of the right, it's a public domain work, we can share things openly. However, the concept of crowdsourcing different parts of a complex whole thing should, of course, really easily translate to many other types of content. So if indeed you have some ideas of other domains where we can use the same content, it will only make things stronger. All right. So there's, uh, we have two minutes left. So Jim is uh, asking a, a, a longer question. So maybe we ask um, if he wants to join the, the stage. Just yes. Okay. Hey, hi. Good morning for me. Good afternoon for you. Um, my question was about licensing. There's, um, I've seen several projects and some projects limit the use of their resulting scores and performances to only non-commercial or academic uses, whereas other projects um, say that their results are put into the public domain and can be used yes. for commercial purposes. Yeah. What is Trompa's attitude towards this? So we are a project funded out of public resources. So our general stance is to give things back to the public domain, to really go from an open science, open data perspective. There are some complications to that from actually a GDPR perspective. So if someone contributes as a person, they do have the right to maybe retract their data. And that's a bit of a controversial topic, especially regarding annotation. So for the transcription of music, we do think we can have people agreeing that they collaboratively help towards this bigger score, which will be a public domain score where they kind of give their, their work to the public. In terms of annotations, we are now investigating how deep and open we can go with that. And we are actually experimenting currently with solid pots, a rather new uh, standard regarding user data management, uh, such that we even wouldn't have them going into services of which we're not so sure if users truly can manage their rights, but in which we can indeed make it fully GDPR compliant, which is really interesting from a data management perspective. Yes, that's interesting. I had not thought of the GDPR aspect of this. Um, but my observation on this from looking at other projects is that it is tempting to think that non-commercial uses is a, a viable restriction. But when you think about actual practicing musicians wanting to use the results of your work, if they use your score to put on a concert, is that a commercial use? If they decide to make a karaoke version of the score, is that a commercial use? If they sell the resulting karaoke version, is that a commercial use? Yeah. That well, that's a very fair point. Mm -hmm. as, as for us, again, I think that for, for us as, as people just offering the, the infrastructure and, and having this public vision, I would say the general things we built with our infrastructure, that's public, but you can always make a branch that you somehow cover and restrict or resell in some form, even though you cannot change the license of the original thing. So we are not planning on really going copy left or anything like that, where we would really restrict anything or re demand it's the same license as us. I do think that mm -hmm. just making these resources as broadly possible, that, that's I think much more interesting than, than becoming very restrictive on that if it's public domain works. Uh, but we would like to keep other people still open to, to do whatever they want. Yeah. Yes, okay. Thank you. So thank you so much um, for that. Um, let me let me just take this chance and ask Jeremy also if he wants to um, very quickly join the the panel and um, ask his question, or otherwise I can. Uh, well, if, I'm if, reading it as well, so I can also just answer. Okay, it you see the yeah? question. It's yeah. pretty long, so yeah. awesome. So, so, so you so, can you can answer it. No problem. So so the the question of Jeremy is that if two uh, snippets are different. That's very easy, or massively different, it's easy to see, but if the snippets are somehow similar, uh, then it might be harder. So, so how is the ability of people to discriminate? Well, that's indeed an open question. And again, we're really interested, we're now about to start first user experiments with that. Actually, we think that if you show these two again to a musicologist, as much as I love them, they will see a lot of tiny differences that maybe someone who is not so experienced will not really notice, and from a general processing perspective is sufficient. So, so we're going to try to do some experiments with it, like these annotations, these commas, indeed, uh, these slurs. Is that something that a, a person who doesn't know music still would see or not? And how can we then use that in a smart way? All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia. That was pretty awesome and very interesting. And um, there's one thing I've learned that um, in all of us, it seems to be more than just one heart. You are, you are also like 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 many others here you are you're a mixed um, person you are an artist you're kind of scientist you're very interested in music classical music and shaping the future of music